Всім добрий вечір. On behalf of every father and every mother wings for freedom. They have our warriors and paves the way for a new history. Dr. Avecha, good evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you're tuning in from. On day 745 of this full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine's defenders fight night and day. Ukrainians from across society work to rescue deported Ukrainians from the Russian-occupied territories of Ukraine. Ordinary women and men continue to build a future for their next generation and ours. Welcome to Tochny. We are a podcast on Apple, Spotify and other platforms. We also run a podcast series called Tochny Talks, which has featured the Wild Hornets, Michael Weiss, Sergei Sebleni, Dr. Maro Gilly, amongst others. Please check out our latest interview from the Wild Hornets with Erland and Daniela to catch that. Tochny's latest research on FPV drones was published in The Economist. Daniela has just released his latest analysis from the data gathered by the fastidious Andrew Perpetua and Gick. Please stay tuned to hear the latest on that a bit later. First up, um, yesterday was the anniversary of the birth of Tarash Shevchenko. His literary heritage, in particular the poetry collection of his, entitled Koz, Ko, Kobza, is regarded by many to be the foundation of modern Ukrainian literature and indeed the foundation of the modern Ukrainian language to some degree. It is therefore um, we're really lucky to be joined just in time, in the nick of time, live from Dnipro, by Vassal, who is going. Hello, hello, hello John Vassal. Welcome. How are Hi, you doing today, Vassal? Uh, uh, it's okay, Jonathan. Hello, all. Great to have you here, Vassal. Um, Vassal, you're you're going to. Um, uh, first of all, we hope you're safe and well. Uh, what do you say? Repeat, please. Uh, we, we hope you're safe and well, Vassal. Uh, yes, thank you. Today was uh, not so loud, but, uh, but, but, but. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, so, everyone, Vassal's going to read us his favourite Shevchenko poem. Uh, he's going to read it first in, 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 in the English Romanized translation, and then secondly in Ukrainian. So, Vassal, could you tell us the name of your favorite Shevchenko poem and take it away when you're ready? Uh, yeah, Jonathan. First of all, I want to say that uh, it's it's not very I think it's not very easy to understand um, the meaning of all of all what the poet making his uh, poem because uh, you should understand that the times when uh, Ukraine were under um, Russian Empire occupation, when Ukraine was uh, was in this slave, yeah, the slave system, and uh, the, the our poets were not in Ukraine. He were um, in some in some. I, I can say he 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 was uh, arrested. Uh, he was under arrest, and uh, he were far from Ukraine. He were in Saint Petersburg, uh, in Caucasus, and other territory. And he continued to write about Ukraine. And uh, he have he has many, many very, I think, good poems. that very very deep, deep poems. And one of I think. Uh, I can't uh, think. I can say that it's the best one because uh, I think uh, every his poem is the best. But uh, I will try to read. Sorry for my maybe pronunciation, maybe not uh, absolutely right. But I will try. It's a poem. Uh, 
It's a poem. Мені однаково чи буду. It's in Ukrainian, but I will try uh, to read in English. Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you. Please go ahead, Vasil. Okay, uh, let's try. <clears throat> I care not if it's in Ukraine or far from here. Here I live, I live and die. I care not if this alien sky remember or forgotten by. Her and her people I remain in slavery, middles alien folk. Grow up I did and miss the yoke of slavery I have died unmourned. Far from the land that is our own and yet is not, I will live forever our sweet Ukraine. And no, and no trace there of me, an exile we will be left. And Father will not say to Son, in prayer our voices let us lift. For one who suffered martyrdom for our Ukraine, I care not if they ever pray for me or not. To me this matters little. But... If I will lose my helpless land to sleep by roofs and cunning, and she wakes in flames and robbed, if such, as fear I greatly, is her lot. To me, this matters very much. We greatly appreciate that, Vassal. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I, ho I hope. Uh, I hope it was. Uh, you can you can understand what I I re read. We could very much. Thank you. It's it's about that uh, for him it doesn't matter what will be with him, but uh, it's very important for him what will be with Ukraine. Vassal, could I ask you to give us the Ukrainian um, version of this poem and? Just just before you read that, the picture that our audience can see in front of them was painted in 1871. Can you tell us when this particular poem was written? Uh, I think it's in 1847 or 1850, I think. Okay. It's earlier. Thank you. All right. On that note, please, sir, please do take it away with the Ukrainian version. Okay. Мені однаково чи буду? Мені однаково чи буду я жити в Україні чи ні? Чи хто згадає, чи забуде мені в снігу на чужині? Одні ковісенько мені. В неволі виріс між чужими. І не оплаканий своїми, в неволі плачучи умру. І все з собою заберу. Oh, sorry, sorry, so, sorry, uh, sorry, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah. Малого сліду не покину на нашій славній Україні, на нашій не своїй землі. І не пом'яне батько з сином, не скаже не синові, молись, молися, сине, за вкраїну, його замучили колись. Мені однаково чи буде той син молитися чи ні, та не однаково мені, як Україну злі люди, Присплять лукаві і вогні. Її окрадену забудять. Ох, не однаково мені. Thank you, Vassal. We greatly appreciate that. Thank you. It's very deep words and very, very, very deep sense. Really deep sense. <sighs> Do stick around, Vassal. Uh, you're welcome to comment on anything you hear, of course, like like always. Um, so uh, make yourself at home, and I'm going to hand over for some latest news and analysis to Joseph. Yeah, yeah, Jonathan. Sorry, I uh, one moment want to say it, if if I can. Mm, please. Yeah, uh, I I want also to say uh, a few words from another poem. I think it's also 
more optimistic. Uh, and on the renewed ears, there will be there will oh, there will be no fall, no adversary, only son and mother, and people will be on the this earth. Six. That's all what I want to say. Thank you, Vassal. All right. Really nice. Over to you, Joseph. Thank you, Jonathan and Vassal. Uh, so I will be presenting the news this week. Uh, first, I'd like to say, please uh, like the stream. Uh, it really helps us spread the word about us and uh, subscribe to Tochni for uh, more updates. We broadcast weekly. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've been uh, getting a lot of success lately. I think a lot of people are uh, citing, citing the work of our contributors, maybe to, to put it generously. <laughs> uh, so thanks, thanks everyone for your support. Uh, so now I will present this week's news. Vitaly Koval, the leader of the Ukrainian State Property Fund, recently engaged in discussions with officials from the Japan International Cooperation Agency and Toho Titanium regarding potential investments in Ukraine's titanium sector. This information was shared by Koval on Telegram, as reported by a correspondent from Ukraine Forum. During a government delegation trip to Tokyo in February, Koval followed up with a meeting on March 8, 2024, with JICA and Toho Titanium representatives to explore investment opportunities within Ukraine's titanium industries. He presented details about major enterprises under the State Property Fund's management, including Zafirisha Titanium, and magnesium plant, uh, Sumi Himprom, which is Sumi Titanium, and the United Mining and Chemical Company, UMCC. Additionally, Koval highlighted the role of Titanium Institute, JSC, dedicated to the research and development of titanium solutions globally. That's the Japanese uh, Institute under the fund supervision. Uh, he emphasized Ukrainian titanium sector's need for financial backing, expertise, and advanced technologies. Uh, Koval stressed the importance of initiating titanium ore processing in Ukraine uh, to compete with Russian access to these valuable resources. The United States has issued a warning to Austria's premier financial institution, Raiffeisen Bank. Raiffeisen Bank. Uh, I'm sure I will get a chiding for that pronunciation later. Uh, international, known as RBI, regarding its operations in Russia indicating potential sanctions and the risk of exclusion from the U.S. financial system. This follows discussions with German banks about similar concerns. The U.S. Treasury highlighted concerns over RBI's possible role in financing Russia's military efforts. Anna Morris, a high-ranking Treasury official, conducted meetings with both the Austrian government and RBI leadership in Vienna. RBI reported significant earnings from its Russian operations, totaling 1.3 billion euros last year, with a substantial presence, including nearly 10,000 employees and 490 retail banking outlets. The bank participated in a Russian program offering loan benefits to military conscripts necessitated by a Russian federal law mandating a loan moratorium for conscripts from October 7, 2022 to December 31, 2023. RBI stands among eight major EU banks that continue to operate in Russia alongside notable institutions such as ING, Commerce Bank, Deutsche Bank, OTP Bank, Intesa San Paolo, Unicredit, and SEB. OTP Bank, notable for its significant profit increase in Russia, also remains unresponsive to inquiries regarding potential future sanctions from the U.S. In addition to Austrian banks, the U.S. Treasury has briefed German banking entities about the sanctions threat, with Commerce Bank acknowledging discussions with representatives from the Office of Foreign Assets Control. These talks revolve around the U.S.'s capability to impose sanctions for activities deemed harmful by the U.S., a power enhanced as of December 22nd by new laws and executive orders. Commerce Bank, which conducts corporate banking for German firms in Russia, emphasizes its strict compliance with sanction regulations, aiming to mitigate risks related to its Russian operations. Similarly, ING, operating in Russia with a significant loan portfolio, asserts its adherence to international sanctions laws, believing it is not currently at risk of U.S. sanctions due to its compliance efforts. On Thursday, a Finnish court handed a businessman a nine-month sentence uh, for breaching EU sanctions against Russia, marking the first instance of such case in a Nordic nation, according to uh, Finnish news outlet Helsingin Sanomat. 
Gabriel Tamin, the CEO of Finland-based logistics and storage firms Luminor Oi and Siberica Oi, was detained in September for suspected violations of EU sanctions. Eastern Usima District Court convicted him of aiding the export of prohibited industrial equipment worth approximately 4,500 euros from Germany to Russia. Despite Siberica Oi's customs declaration stating that Kazakhstan as the shipments of the destination, the company's internal records show the merchandise was actually sent to St. Petersburg. The prosecution has advocated for a jail term of up to four years, highlighting that the businessman shipped over 3,500 drones and other military dual-use items to Russia. So as far as I could tell, the discrepancy there between like the amount of drones and the 4,500 euros, I think that these are only specifically sanctioned components, the value of those components, either in the material he sent or specifically stuff that was sanctioned. I think that the 35, uh, 3,500 or 3,500 uh drones are dual use items meaning that like he was allowed to send them there but i'm not i'm not clear on that i was i tried to clarify i couldn't however the court concluded on thursday that although the merchandise had transited through russia there wasn't sufficient proof uh to confirm that it had remained in the country as reported by finnish public broadcaster ile um so uh as far as i can tell that means that the major charges against him like he's not gonna get four years in prison for it but he got a suspended sentence as a result uh, previously in September, due to their participation in transporting a wide array of electronics into Russia, including UAV cameras, high-performance optical filters, and lithium batteries, the U.S. Treasury added the French-born businessman and his uh, companies to the sanctions list. Democratic Party members in the U.S. House of Representatives have initiated an inquiry into SpaceX, led by Elon Musk, to address if the company has instituted sufficient measures to prevent Russia from utilizing its Starlink satellite internet service in the ongoing invasion against Ukraine. According to the Washington Post, Representatives Jamie Raskin and Robert Garcia dispatched a letter on Wednesday evening urging the company to disclose any reports of potential illegal procurements of Starlink terminals, especially within Russian-controlled territories of Ukraine. The lawmakers' concerns were sparked by claims from Ukrainian intelligence officials that Russian forces have been deploying the company's terminals in eastern Ukraine, potentially violating U.S. sanctions. There have been indications from Ukrainian intelligence that Russian forces are using SpaceX terminals in eastern Ukraine, contradicting U.S. sanctions on the matter. This issue prompted lawmakers to caution SpaceX President Gwen Shotwell about the severe implications of Russia's alleged usage of Starlink highlighting the potential risks to Ukrainian security, the lives of Ukrainians, and the security of the United States. We are worried that there might not be adequate controls in place, uh, which was expressed by Raskin and Garcia in their communication to SpaceX. The Ministry of Defense's of Ukraine's main intelligence directorate, uh, Hor, uh, had earlier confirmed an uptick in Starlink terminals used by Russian forces. Intelligence intercepts reveal that Starlink terminals were installed within the 83rd Air Assault Brigade of the Russian Armed Forces, which is active in the Donetsk region near Klashivka and Amdrivka for internet access. The International Criminal Court has announced on March 5th the issuance of arrest warrants against two high-ranking Russian military officials, Sergei Koblyash and Viktor Sokolov, for their involvement in crimes with Ukraine, uh, spanning from October 10th, 2022 to March 9th, 2023. These individuals are accused of orchestrating attacks on civilian infrastructure, causing undue harm to civilians or damage to civilian assets, and engaging in inhumane acts which constitute crimes against humanity. Kobilyash holds the rank of, sorry, Koblyash, I don't know why I keep saying Koblyash, Koblyash, holds the rank of Lieutenant General and commands the long-range aviation sector of Russia's aerospace force. Sokolov, with the rank of Admiral, previously led Russia's Black Sea Fleet. Uh, next item. Next topic, I suppose I should say. In honor of International Women's Day, the Military Media Center, through a telegram update reported by Ukraine Forum, had disclosed that as of January 2024, the Ukrainian army comprises 45,587 female soldiers, marking an increase of 2,108 since October 2023. Among these service women, 
13,487 hold the status of combatants currently. It is also noted that over 4,000 women are actively serving in conflict zones. Overall, the number of women employed and serving in the Ukrainian armed forces exceeds 62,000. This update coincided with the celebration of International Women's Day for Women's Rights and International Peace uh, on March 8th. This year, female soldiers of the armed forces of Ukraine have received sets of summer field uniforms designed to fit women's parameters for the first time. The Ukrainian troops have already received 50,000 sets of female summer uniforms. The troops already receiving the sets, uh, which were announced by the Ministry of Defense, are designed to ensure comfort of women during field missions at permanent bases. The uniforms are available in a wide range of sizes from 40 to 64, accommodating heights from 146 to 188 centimeters, and come in two weight categories, two and three. I don't know who designed those weight categories, but uh, moving on. Uh, this initiative was a collaborative effort uh, between a dedicated unit of armed forces, non-governmental organizations, and Ukrainian manufacturers following successful testing by a military unit. Good and great. Those would be the two categories I would. Anyway, uh, moving on. Deputy Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Natalia Kamil Kal Kalnikova, highlighted the effort and intention behind the development of these uniforms, uh, noting the significance and increasing number of women serving in the Ukrainian military. In 2024, the ministry plans to acquire 65,000 sets of summer uniforms and 100,000 sets of uh, under, under uniforms with procurement tenders initiated in January. This development follows the introduction of the unified female uniform concept in July 2022, the start of volunteer production in autumn of that same year, and the initiation of testing by the government uh, by year's end. Additionally, the first armored vest designed specifically for women's body shapes was approved by the Defense Ministry with an updated summer field uniform for female soldiers prototype presented in July of 2023. Next topic. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I tried to uh, mute on that clearing my throat. Uh, next uh, topic is... Woof. Uh, on his visit to Turkey, uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky uh, toured a shipyard to inspect the progress of uh, two corvettes under construction for Ukraine. Uh, during his visit, Zelensky posted on Facebook that he engaged with the equipment and engaged in discussions with the Ukrainian Navy personnel involved. Furthermore, Zelensky reviewed the ongoing construction of a second corvette of the Ada class, which he has named after the Ukrainian Hetman, uh, Ivan uh, Vyhovsky. Uh, the expressed gratitude towards the president of Turkey and all Turkish and Ukrainian defense firms, uh, collaboration, uh, sorry, uh, President Zelensky expressed gratitudes towards the president of Turkey and all the Turkish and Ukrainian defense firms, uh, collaborating to hastening the arrival of peace and ensure the stability, according to Zelensky. Uh, prior to this, it was reported that Zelensky arrived in Turkey on an official visit on the 8th of March. In August 2023, it was announced that Turkey would construct a second uh, Ada-type corvette to fulfill the requirements of the Ukrainian Navy, with the keel-laying ceremony already conducted at an Istanbul shipyard. Zelensky has decreed that this Ada-class corvette for the Ukrainian Armed Forces, uh, currently being constructed, will bear the name of the uh, 17th century uh, Hetman. Additionally, in August 2022, uh, Zelensky named the first Ada class Corvette in the Ukrainian Navy as Ivan Mazepa, which is also being built in Turkey for Ukraine. During a press conference in Odessa on March 6th, as reported by Ukraine Forum, uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky announced that Ukraine and Greece have started drafting a bilateral security agreement. Zelensky highlighted the commencement of this collaboration with Greek Prime Minister uh, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, expressing optimism that the respective teams would soon finalize the agreement for signing. Zelensky outlined that the forthcoming agreement aims to formalize the level of cooperation and support between Ukraine and Greece for the current year and the next decade in the realm of security. 
Furthermore, he emphasized the importance of intensifying sanctions against Russia to diminish its capability to fund its aggressive actions. Zelensky argued for the need to cut financial resources to Putin, stating that reducing Putin's financial capabilities directly impacts the number of people harmed. I think the implication there is that Greece has been involved a bit in uh, shipping Russian oil uh, with, with certain fleets. Uh, he stressed that the absence of peace or diplomatic intentions from Putin's side, underscoring the uh, necessity to reinforce sanctions against Russia, hold Russian perpetrators accountable for their actions to and uh, to support Ukraine's defense. Uh, and uh, also to back the International Criminal Court's efforts uh, and combat Russian misinformation. Additionally, President Zelensky has nominated uh, Valery Zaluzhny, the former chief of the armed forces of Ukraine, as the country's new ambassador to the United Kingdom. The Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs has formally requested the UK's agreement for the appointment. According to the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry's website and Zelensky's evening address, as well as a report from European Pravda, on Thursday, uh, the 7th of March, the president of Ukraine endorsed Valery Zaluzhny as the ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary of Ukraine to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine has followed the necessary agreement request to the UK. Uh, Zelensky further highlighted in this evening video message that he himself had uh, desire, sorry, that Zaluzhny himself had expressed desire to transition to a diplomatic role. An insider with the government uh, revealed to European Pravda that the foreign ministry viewed Zaluzhny's potential appointment positively, but recommended delaying it for a few months to allow Zaluzhny time to enhance his English proficiency. Prior to his nomination, Vadim Pristaiko uh, had served as the foreign minister and was ambassador to the UK until his dismissal in July 2023. Uh, Mikhailo Podoliak, uh, an advisor to the president's office mentioned the necessity of revising military strategies and avoiding stalemates at the front as reasons for Zaluzhny's removal as defense minister. Uh, when questioned about the dismissal of Zaluzhny recently, uh, Zelensky explained it as part of a broader overhaul and reformation of the military's command structure. Next item. The capacity for refining oil in Russia has been notably impacted by a series of drone strikes by Ukraine on the refineries across the nation, leading to a projected delay in restoration efforts due to sanctions. The UK's Ministry of Defense, referring, referencing British intelligence reports, uh, noted this development. In response to a surge in domestic demand, Russia, starting on March 1st, 2024, has imposed a six-month halt on gasoline exports to maintain market stability. Analysts suggest that this ban could alleviate the pressure on supply, facilitating the repair process at refineries. However, due to Western sanctions limiting the import of crucial components, these repairs are expected to extend beyond typical durations. The Russian government, facing upcoming presidential elections from March 15th through the 17th, so-called presidential elections, is likely to be particularly alert to potential rises in prices for gasoline and other essential daily items. Earlier reports from Ukraine Forum highlighted a UAV attack on an oil depot in Russia's Kursk region, resulting in the destruction of two diesel fuel tanks. Further exacerbating Russia's challenges, uh, Ukrainian drones targeted two oil refineries in Russia's southern Krasnodar region last month, causing a significant fire at Ilsky refinery attributed to operations by the Ukrainian security services, the SBU. Uh, while regional Russian authorities confirmed the fire, uh, they didn't specify the cause or the impact of the impact. The attack notably hit the main processing unit, and a similar assault was directed also near a Fipsky oil refinery, although the outcome of that operation is uh, unclear. During a meeting in Kyiv with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, the UK's defense minister, Grant Shops, announced that the UK will provide over 10,000 drones to Ukraine in 2024. This initiative, part of a uh, British uh, 325 million pound funding package, aims to enhance Ukraine's defense against Russia's unauthorized incursion by leveraging UK's uh, leading defense technologies. The package includes more than 10,000 drones, primarily FPV drones, along with 1,000 one-way attack drones developed in the UK, and various surveillance and maritime drones. 
Shops emphasized that the UK's commitment to bolstering Ukraine with cutting-edge drone technology from its defense industry and urged international allies to support the effort. He highlighted the effectiveness of UK-donated weapons in Ukrainian operations, primarily in damaging nearly 30% of Russia's Black Sea fleet, with over £100 million dedicated to maritime capabilities. The UK aims to reinforce Ukraine's position on the Black Sea. This announcement followed Ukraine's uh, defense contact group meeting, where more than 50 countries discussed military support to Ukraine, and the UK, alongside Latvia, agreed to lead an international coalition to enhance Ukraine's drone capabilities. Additionally, Canada has also committed to joining the global initiative to enhance Ukraine's UAV fleet capabilities, as stated by the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense and reported by Ukraine Forum. Minister Blair pledged Canada's involvement in the Drone Capability Coalition, which is again co-led by Latvia and the UK. Uh, and uh, this announcement follows the UK's announcement. Additionally, uh, the uh, Canada has previously declared the country's plan to ramp up the production of 155 millimeter artillery shells, addressing Ukraine's urgent need for ammunition to counter Russia's military actions. Uh, I should add, so Colby doesn't yell at me, though, that as of the latest updates, we haven't seen significant Canadian investment in this sector, uh, and we'll certainly update you when we do. Uh, next item. On Wednesday, March 6th, a farmer's protest in Warsaw, Poland, escalated into violent clashes, leading to injuries among several police officers and the detention of numerous individuals. According to European Pravda, citing Polsat News, the unrest began during a demonstration outside the Polish Sejm uh, parliament building, which uh, protesters engaged in disturbances, pushing, and acts of aggression. After 1400, some participants re resorted to throwing cobblestones at the police, who responded with tear gas. Attempts by protesters to forcibly enter the parliament were thwarted, and clashes spread to nearby streets. The police are working to prevent the spread of violence to other areas of Warsaw and have reported several officers injured during the confrontations. More than a dozen individuals have been detained, particularly those aiming to breach the barriers around the parliament building. This protest follows a series of demonstrations by Polish farmers in recent months, sparked by grievances that led them to set fire to tires in front of the Prime Minister's office on Wednesday on the 6th of March. Prime Minister Donald Tusk has extended an invitation uh, to protesting farmers for a meeting on Saturday, which I will cover now. <laughs> on March 9th, Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk did not succeed at finding a resolution with Polish farmers to halt protests against Ukrainian agricultural imports, as reported by Polsky Radio. The discussions, which lasted three hours on March 9th, concluded without an agreement to end the demonstration that has been ongoing across Poland and at the Ukrainian border for a month. The protests stem from concerns over Ukrainian agricultural imports and the EU's Green Deal, with demonstrators demanding action against the perceived threats that these imports pose to Polish agriculture. Despite previous statements hitting at potential border closure for trade, uh, Tusk affirmed that Poland would not be shutting down the border with Ukraine. This stance comes amidst denials from Ukraine's Deputy Economy Minister Tarech uh, Kachka regarding talks with Poland about a temporary trade blockade. During the meeting, Tusk reportedly critiqued Polish agricultural officials and hinted at possible dismissals. Uh, Michael Kolodzijak, the Polish Agriculture Deputy Minister, offered concrete proposals to the farmers, including financial support and adjustments to EU policies. However, the lack of agreement has spurred plans for a significant protest across Poland on March 20th, announced by uh, Tomasz Obrzanski of the Independent Trade Union of Individual Farmers, uh, quote unquote, solidarity. The Polish government acknowledges the farmers' grievances, attributing them to the EU's continuation of a free trade agreement with Ukraine initiated in 2022, which has led to an influx of cheaper Ukrainian products. Poland has responded by banning several Ukrainian agricultural goods, such as grain, to protect their farmers. Ukrainian Prime Minister Denis Shmihal has noted that the trade disputes and border blockade have a more significant economic impact on Poland than Ukraine, with only a small fraction of Ukrainian agricultural exports being transported by road. I believe the figure was, he said, he claimed 5% go through Poland, 95% are exported through what he called maritime routes, uh, which some, some of which might be in Poland, I don't know. Um, next, or, uh, 
uh, additionally, I should say, uh, the Committee on the Freedom of Speech of the Verhovna Radka, uh, sorry, Rada, led by Yaroslav uh, Yorchishin from the Holos Party, has formally approached Poland's parliamentary bodies, requesting an investigation into the detention of journalists from Ukranska Pravda at the Russian border. Mikhailo uh, Tkach and cameraman Yaroslav Bondarenko were detained while reporting with their equipment uh, confiscated and facing threats ex of uh, extended detention without contact. Uh, Yura Chishin uh, emphasized that this act is both an infringement on journalistic freedom and a human rights issue, urging Polish authorities for transparency and accountability. Despite valuing Poland's support in the ongoing conflict, the committee insists on addressing this matter to uphold the journalistic integrity and human rights standards uh, awaiting a formal response from Polish legislative bodies. Um, I should add that the border with Russia is considered a like restricted zone in Poland right now. It's like heavily monitored and uh, uh, you know guarded by the military. Um, and the Ukrainian journalists were there to report on the importation of Russian agricultural products, which I would basically say that is we know is definitely happening. Like they're not sanctioned, and also. Um, there were discussions in the Polish government as well as other governments to just ban the outright uh, ban the importation of these products outright. Um, so those journalists were there to investigate, you know, how, how much Russian grain is coming into Poland and like in what manner it's coming. And they were approached by Polish police and the Polish police claimed that they 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 have a right to detain people in Poland for not having your identification. Um, and that's basically what they claim they detained them for, which I find pretty improbable, right? Like that some foreign journalists didn't have their passports. Like, are you kidding me? Right. But I mean, as far as I could tell, the Polish government is probably a bit justified in being nervous about their border with Russia. But I think that the way that they detain these journalists seems a bit um, un unusual. I'll put it that way. Um, and I think it's right for the Ukrainians to maybe demand some answers there. So um, that's maybe my, my opinion or my, my own research. But uh We'll go ahead and move on to the next topic. Over the past two decades, the mayor's office in the Siberian city of Krasnoyarsk has been managing a voluntary service initiative for teenagers between the ages of 14 and 18, known as the Mayor's Labor Brigade. However, since the previous year, teenagers from Krasnoyarsk have been assigned a new range of responsibilities. As reported by a spokesperson for the mayor's office, they are now engaged in sewing and assembling welfare packages for Russian forces involved in Ukraine. The sewing equipment was supplied by local business people following a request from the leader of the Central District Administration. And the Kremlin focuses on the production of arm armaments for the ongoing invasion uh, Russia's economic resources are heavily allocated towards the war effort, and this has led to a shortage of workers across many sectors, uh, which has pushed up wages in many fields, but also leads to uh, a shortage of the ability to supply basic necessities for the military. The 2024 recruitment drive for the Krasnoyarsk Initiative, which is one of several programs nationwide involving minors uh, supporting war activities, has recently been launched. This trend has been identified by a labor expert as part of an ongoing trend in Russia towards the militarization of youth, which is uh, emphasized in uh, young boys wearing camouflage, uh, walking, uh, sorry, uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, Russian organizations, I'll put it that way, like Unarmia and Young Pioneers, which uh, uh, help propagate this militarization of the youth in addition to the idea that now they should directly be supporting materially Russian soldiers. Uh, these militarized efforts are increasingly being undertaken by businesses attempting to mitigate the workforce deficit with a burgeoning uh, war-focused shadow economy, explained uh, an economics expert in Russia who wanted to remain anonymous. The utilization of child labor poses a risk for employers, uh, as most underage workers are employed without necessary legal documentation. A representative from the Krasnoyarsk Labor Brigade conveyed to RFE that the volunteers, sorry, that's Radio Free Europe, that the volunteers uh, are uh, selected to their preferred task, mentioning the option to produce items for the Ukraine uh, war produced last, uh, was started last summer and attracted considerable interest. 
in the past two months alone, the teenagers have dispatched uh, 300 items to uh, this. Again, this is all just the statements of the uh, governments, uh, the Russian local government that is in charge of this initiative. Uh, they've donated 300 items to these Russian soldiers. Uh, some parents have reported that city officials uh, visit schools to enlist volunteers. Uh, during his address on February 29th, President Vladimir Putin can, uh, commended the child workforce uh, and uh, the, uh, sorry, he, he commended the workforce, business owners, engineers, volunteers, political parties, and others for their dedicated and unceasing efforts in defense of Russia's interests. Uh, also included in the workforce, I should add, are children. Uh, in recent times, this initiative has involved children as young uh, as the age of nine or ten. Uh, for instance, in November, students from school number eight in Mozhka, a town in Udmurtia, initiated a voluntary, uh, quote, uh, project to assist injured war veterans. Uh, they began uh, knitting specialized stockings for amputees to prevent uh, irritation from prosthetic limbs. Uh, they called the initiative uh, Stockings for Stumps, and this is, this is real. Uh, the initiative saw participation from students, mothers, and grandmothers in knitting the stockings, and the school was renamed in December 22 to honor a former student who died in Ukraine. Uh, the program's coordinator uh, noted that the involvement of mothers and grandmothers helped the children learn knitting techniques, and the objective was to offer moral and physical support to those in the special, so-called special military operation who have undergone amputations. Uh, in another example, uh, children have been finishing stabilizing fins for drones dropped for bombs uh, intended in Ukraine. Uh, they're printed with 3D printers and then refined and polished by the children. Uh, some students indicated that although recruitment was voluntary, there's an underlying pressure suggesting that refusal could lead to adverse consequences. Uh, there were hints of coercion uh, one anonymous student shared with RFE. Uh, they didn't outright force us, but they suggested uh, that participation in socially significant activities would be considered for college admissions, another student remarked. I wasn't bothered since I volunteered will willingly, and I heard others join to fulfill the requirements, but then had their mothers do all the knitting. Uh, I should add just my, my own editorial. That kid sucks and is a narc. Uh, it sucks for volunteering to do, do terrible things. And anyway, uh, the initial gathering of the team uh, tasked the establishment of NATO Ukraine Joint Analysis Training and Education Center, uh, or JTEC as it's known. Uh, sorry, this is a this is a totally new uh, line line item. I, I uh, neglected to mention that uh, the initial gathering of the team tasked with the establishment of the NATO Ukraine Joint Analysis Training and Education Center, or JTEC, uh, marks the first collaborative venture uh, formally between NATO and Ukraine. Occurred in uh, Bigoj, Poland, as reported by a, a government uh, statement during this inaugural meeting. Olha Stefanshia. The Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine, uh, responsible for European and Euro-Atlantic integration, delivered a speech to attendees. Uh, she extended her thanks to all the project's contributors and to Poland for its decision to host the significant project within its borders. She pointed out the significance of the JTAC as a long-term initiative, uh, JTAC, sorry, underscoring its role as a key facet of NATO's comprehensive assistance package to Ukraine. She highlighted the necess necessity of sufficient resources to support the center's operations to achieve the ambitious objectives laid out by the founders. Uh, she called on the project team to concentrate on pressing issues uh, and would contribute to efficient solutions within the security and defense realms. Uh, Militarni covered the establishment of the center. Uh, NATO Secretary General uh, underscored the importance of the joint center and noted its significance not only for Ukraine, but NATO. Uh, Stoltenberg kept specifics of the center's operations under wraps, but mentioned that it would uh, certainly enhance the experience sharing process, as he called it. Next item. Yeah, I think this is my second. No, this is my final item. A lot of news this week, guys. Uh, following an explosion that damaged a bridge, rail operations in the Samara region of Russia were partially suspended on Monday, as reported by state-run media outlets citing emergency services sources. An explosive event took place around 5 a.m. on a rail bridge crossing the Chapaivka River, uh, as uh, quoted by TASS, emergency services. A result of the explosion, the operation of trains over the, uh, sorry, as a result, uh, the operation of trains over the bridge was temporarily halted. 
The source, who remained anonymous, pointed out that preliminary investigations indicated the explosion had compromised the bridge's structural supports and handrails. TASS later elaborated, based on a statement from local railway authorities, that the service disruption was attributed to illegal actions by individuals not authorized to interfere with railway operations. This uh, incident caused delays for five passenger trains operating in the region. Simultaneously, Russia has taken legal action against young individuals for their involvement in pro-Ukraine railway sabotage activities. Ukrainian military intelligence Hoor acknowledged the explosion on the railway bridge, uh, although it remained unclear if the act was directly linked uh, to themselves. The railway in question was being used by the invading country for transporting military materials, including ammunition produced at the JSC polymer factory in Chapayevs, Hoor stated. In other words, when asked, Hoor basically said, well, this is a legitimate target, but they didn't really say like we did it. So <laughs> I don't know. Uh, located about 40 kilometers south of Samara, the regional capital in Chapayevsk has a population of roughly 70,000. Uh, Hoare noted that the damage inflicted on the railway bridge would render it unsuitable for some time, although it did not detail the method used to assess that damage. Uh, since indicating its, uh, sorry, since initiating the full-scale invasion, Russia has reported several instances of attacks on its transportation infrastructure, attributing these sabotage efforts uh, to Ukrainian operations. So that concludes uh, my my little news report for this week. But I've I've got a couple of things I wanted to uh, you know clarify with with a few people. So first, it's uh, with John. So John, um, I, how are you doing, John? First off, I'm doing pretty well. Can y'all hear me? Yes, you sound good. Um, yep. So sorry, I just I just read a lot of news. Uh, my brain's still a little fried there. Uh, pr had to pronounce a lot of European names, John. Uh, anyways. Um, I think you wanted to talk about the Russian GLSDB. Is that right? Well, SDB, but uh, more or less. Sure. Yeah, maybe you can clarify for our audience like what that is. Maybe introduce it, and uh, yeah, just go ahead, John. Uh, can one of y'all get the tweet that I sent over? Can one of y'all get that pulled up? think we're working on it john the visual aid's important so that was the wrong one i'm sorry no. <laughs> <It's coming. laughs> jamie pull that up there you are all right wonderful so uh, in the past week or so uh, it would appear the russians have deployed a new uh, previously unseen precision guided munition of some description uh, it started circulating on uh, this one particular ukrainian telegram channel about two or so days ago and then once they had published those images a bunch of russian telegram channels including fighter bomber followed it up and posted their own uh, images of the new munition so if you can pull up that first image there uh, in that tweet so fighter bomber posted this and this appears to be the the new munition overall uh it's a glide munition of, of some description uh the description provided by fighter bomber is that it's about 30 centimeters in diameter 300 millimeters in other words um, real quick john who's fighter bomber for the uninitiated right so fighter bomber is a russian telegram channel uh that is affiliated with the vks russian aerospace forces if my memory is sir if my memory is correct i believe the guy that runs it has been identified or likely identified as he's like some captain in the vks his name's been published by some ukrainian OSINT uh, outlets like a year or so ago um so it's a, in the short form is it's a russian telegram channel affiliated with their with their air force um he had posted this and uh, his description, uh, along with those shared by a couple other Russian telegram channels as well, is that it's a glide munition, 30 centimeters in diameter with about a 100 kilogram warhead. What is interesting about it is that because it's 30 centimeters in diameter, that's the same diameter uh, as the rockets used by Smirch and more specifically Tornado S, which is an upgraded version that can fire various guided munitions. So the whole premise here seems to be that 
It can either be released by aircraft or with a rocket booster attached to launch from the Tornado S system, which is again a 300 millimeter uh, multiple rocket launch system. So, in this sense, it's sort of analogous to the US GBU 39B, the small diameter bomb, or the GLS to be uh, ground launch small diameter bomb that's now in Ukrainian service. Uh, in terms of a small-ish glide bomb that can be either launched from aircraft or delivered via uh, multiple rocket launch systems. Um, it's not quite in the same size class. Again, this is a 100 kilogram, so about 200, 250 pound warhead, whereas, um, well, we're probably looking at probably 250 kilogram overall mass here, whereas um SDB in U.S. service is closer to about 100 kilograms or about 250 pounds, roughly. So it's, it's a decent bit bigger, but the overall concept seems to be somewhat similar. Its designation is the UMPB D30SN, I believe. Um, UMPB stands for Universal Interspecific Glide Munition in Russian, which denotes that it can, it can again, either be launched from aircraft or launch from multiple 300 millimeter multiple rocket launch systems. Um, my sort of initial hypothesis, just looking at the images of the munition itself, they're published by fighter bomber as well as wreckage images that were posted by some both Ukrainian and Russian telegram channels. My initial guess, and this is just again, just kind of a preliminary estimate, is that it may be derived from the body of a, a KAB 250. So if you'll scroll down to the next tweet that I posted there. No, the next one. Yes, so either of those. So the KAB-250, it is a precision guided munition that's been variously in service with the Russians since the, I think, early 2010s, if my memory is correct. It comes in either uh, laser guided or satellite and inertial guided versions and again it's a 250 uh, kilogram bomb it kind of looks like just again visually looking at it it looks like they may have taken and again this is just my my initial guess that they may have taken spare uh, cab 250 bodies and converted them into these glide munitions um, some of the descriptions given again from both ukrainian and russian telegram channels was that um, this new device, the, the D-30SN, appears to be a uh, GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite System, uh, and inertially uh, guided, so analogous to, say, JDAM or the UMPKs. More specifically, there were some claims that the Russians specifically repurposed a guidance kit derived from what they've been using with the UMPKs, which, again, for, for those who aren't particularly familiar, those are the, the glide kits they've been installing on their previously unguided general purpose bombs. So the uh, FAB 250, 200 kilogram uh, general purpose bombs, the uh, FAB 500s, the 500 kilogram versions, and then a couple larger, the thousands, and the FAB 1500s now. Um, I, obviously, I can't verify that without a full detailed teardown of the guidance hardware, but that was a claim that was circulating amongst some Ukrainian telegram channels. I think it's plausible, but I can't actually validate that without a full uh, hardware teardown. So, John, um, I guess maybe for people who understand that Russia now has like a small, smaller, well, I should say, as some, as from my understanding from what you're saying, or my takeaway is Russia had a bigger glide bomb that they were using, but now they have a smaller one that might be better for certain applications. Is that kind of the takeaway? So what they're probably going to get out of this is th th there's a couple potential ways to look at this. So on the one hand, the aerodynamics of the FAB series, which is their, their primary series of general purpose bombs, the aerodynamics of them are not fantastic, nor are the aerodynamics of the UMPK modules they've been installing to turn them into uh, precision guided glide bombs. They're kind of these big, chunky um, bomb casings. The glide ratio on those things is probably not fantastic. They're getting about 60 to 70 kilometers or so from a high altitude, high airspeed release. One of the things that they can potentially do with the these new ones, the D30SNs, is that they've been largely purpose engineered as glide bombs, it appears. And just looking at it visually, it seems like this would potentially have a much better glide ratio 
So this could potentially allow them to um, generate air to surface fires at greater ranges uh, if they're going to be releasing from the same uh, altitudes and air speeds they've been releasing the UMPKs. On the other hand, it may allow them to achieve similar ranges, 60, 70 kilometers from lower altitude and lower air speeds. Um, so it'll give them uh, not only just an increased ability to generate air to surface fires, but greater flexibility in how they how they do that. Again, assuming um, these actually enter production at scale. And then on the ground launch side, as far as I'm aware, none of the images that I've seen have been indicative of a ground launch version. That's, again, just something that's just been postulated by the Russian Telegram channels, again, fighter bomber in particular. Um, if they do begin to roll them out, um, which I think those will be infrequent relative to the air launched ones, because to actually successfully ground launch them, you need to act, you need to design and manufacture a solid rocket motor to actually get them up um, to launch them from the from the actual launcher itself, and then get them up to sufficient altitude and airspeed for them to actually release from the booster, deploy their wings, and actually begin gliding. Again, analogous to GLSDB. Um, that could potentially compensate uh, in some deficits if they're having any with Tornado S production. Um, they have a specific uh, GNSS, INS guided rock, a 300 millimeter rocket system, essentially analogous to Gimler's that they've been using since the beginning of the invasion. Um, depending on what the production rate uh, of that is used, uh, you know, this could potentially help them compensate for shortfalls in their production of their of their guided MR of their existing guided MRLs. And then the other thing from an air launch standpoint is because they're smaller than the fabs, uh, the fab 250s and the fab 200s. Uh, well, I should just say they're smaller than the fab 500s. They could potentially carry more uh, per sortie. On the one hand, um, I believe they need to design a new pylon and ejector rack for them. I'm not. I don't believe they have any sort of dual stack uh, ejector racks like we do um just the single ones for the you know carrying a single fab 500 so that may take them some time to operationalize if they have to design manufacture and validate and you know new uh, racks and ejectors to actually carry a, a double pack of these bombs on a given uh, hard point on say the the su-34s or the su-35s Okay, Johnny. Anything else you want to add about the uh, new new Russian bomb, or uh, uh, that that wraps it up? Yeah, I don't think there's anything else really with the currently available information. Um, have to you know wait and see what their impact's going to be, how the design evolves, uh, what their efficacy is, etc. Yeah, thanks, John. I guess uh, keep us posted on any uh, reports of the impact and uh, any any other new. New killing machines that Russia comes up with. Uh, so thanks, thanks, John. Uh, so next, I think we're going to. I'm going to turn it over to Erland. Uh, Erland saw some reporting on the recent uh, conscription laws in Ukraine that he thought was being kind of misrepresented or misunderstood. Um, so I think Erland uh, is trying to do a little bit of an investigation to clear that up. So uh, Erland, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Joseph. Um, well, yeah, there's been a lot of uh, uh, at least uh, messaging in Twitter uh, that makes me question the, the accuracy and also uh, to be honest uh, I, I just wanted to to try and clear up what is actually happening with the mobilization bill so I asked Vasil which is a Ukrainian lawyer if he could maybe help us understand it a little bit so Vasil um, uh, yeah Erland if Luke you can him. help us if yeah we can hear you thank you if yeah if okay. you can if you can help us clear up a little bit of the misunderstandings, that I think that would be amazing. Let's um, try. Let's try. Yeah. So, okay. Let's first uh, start by um, what is this mobilization bill? Uh, what does it change? Uh, what is what is the aim of the bill? I guess. Uh, yeah, Erland. Uh, first of all, uh, this draft bill uh, is changing. Uh, is changing some rules about mobilization such rules uh, like uh, the um, age from uh, what age you can be mobilized in army uh, now uh, you can be uh, mobilized only if you are uh, more than 27 years old 
after this, uh, if this draft bill uh, will become a law, uh, uh, the age uh, will be 20, 25 years. And this also, is this is mobilized for the war, right? It's not. Yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. normal conscription. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, not normal conscription. It's not. Uh, it's not a mandatory military service. If you understand what I mean. Yes. So I think maybe that's another thing we need to explain. Ukraine has a mandatory military service in peacetime. Mm -hmm. We, right? we had, we had, yeah. we had, okay. we had it before war, before full scale invasion, yeah, because war started in 2014 for Ukraine, but full scale invasion in 2022. And uh, we have this, this system. And uh, uh, last, uh, uh, last mandatory military service was in 2021, in autumn so of 2021. So no, no new, no new uh, conscripts for the general uh, military service was for mandatory uh, military yeah. service. And yeah. this is one one year, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, one year, and in some units is one and a half. Understood. Yeah, and uh, such system was for uh, young men, for eight eighteen years old. Yeah uh who who wasn't go to university or another high school uh he uh, have had to go uh, in uh, mandatory military service but after full scale invasion uh pre the president uh, didn't uh, issue uh, decrees about uh, new one new one subscription yeah uh, for mandatory military service and all only about mobilization okay so uh, basically af after the full-scale invasion started martial law was introduced and uh, a lot of different rules changed um and they didn't call up people for their one-year mandatory service anymore yeah but yeah but we who... have but but we had a problem that uh, those uh, people who served in this mandatory uh, service uh, were haven't been demobilized de demobilized even now. They yeah, so have, they're still uh, serve. They're still serving. Yes, they're still serving. Uh, I think one month ago, where uh, have been passed a bill about their demobilization. And uh, president, I think this week, uh, issued the decree to demobilize, demobilize this man. Uh, it's about this mandatory service, military service. Yeah. Uh, how many people are in that situation, more or less? Mm, I'm not sure because uh, I think someone of them can sign uh, a contract and uh, become an uh, ordinary military unit, yeah? Mm. That is why I think it's about, uh, uh, it's absolutely about thousands of people, maybe uh, 30 thousands, maybe 50, I'm not sure. It's about something like that, I think. So we're not talking about the the, the main uh, battle force of, of the army, but it's uh, still... no, 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 no. Oh. But uh, but Ireland, this uh, this uh, soldiers um, um, mainly uh, haven't been involved in a um, bat battlefield, in main battlefield. Yeah, in. Yeah, because there is a law in Ukraine that says that these um, uh, which are serving under the, the first uh, one year term, they are not supposed to go to the front lines. Yeah, in a such situation. No, it's not about uh, mobilization in a martyr according to martyr law. Because uh, if it's about mobilization according to martyr law, uh, you, you, you can be mobilized, yeah? After that, you will go to study, 
uh, not less i think maybe one month maybe more and after that you will go uh, in a military unit in some of brigades uh, according uh, your uh, according your uh, achievements according to your um, what you can to do it according to it yeah depending on the military education yeah yeah yes. okay yeah so yeah. these and this these... and and this uh, yeah yeah so these oh. these soldiers that were in this uh, situation where they they couldn't uh, end their one year military or their first time military service because of the martial law they are being demobilized but they're not they will they will be demobilized in uh, april uh, and uh, may this year according to issued decree president's decree and they are um not being uh, the, i understood that they cannot be mobilized again until 12 months uh, uh I, like yeah. yeah 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 okay so and those... this uh, but but it's about another rule Th uh, this draft bill which we are discussing which is uh, uh, now uh, have passed uh, first uh, reading here yeah? uh, he it's it's this law draft bill this it's about changing rules it is it's about age it's about uh, changing rules in um, system um, mobilization system that it uh, will be changed uh, from papers to IT systems. It obligates everyone who is under this age to uh, come to mobilize centers or in by internet or another administrative uh, authorities and uh, uh, give actual information about yourself because uh, we have uh, problems with uh, information uh, with not information this system our government uh, i i think uh, uh, don't know about all men's uh, in country enough so, so basically they need to update the, their info which is for instance where they live what education yeah. they have, what profession yeah. they have. I guess yeah. if, if there is any medical issues, they maybe need yeah. to upload some documents. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. they have a delay or they have another reasons not to be mobilized, because uh, even for now, uh, our system is not very good because even my friends who are fighting now receive uh, documents from mobilize for mobilization centers that they obligate them to come to them <laughs> because uh, they don't have information that they have been already mobilized yeah so they're and basically already so they're basically modernizing the system and, uh, and clearing up uh, uh, yeah. errors in the registry i understand yeah yeah and also it's uh, uh, make some uh, penalties uh, extra penalties for people who uh, not uh, come to mobilization center, not update their info, and uh, and make uh, another another break in the law. Yeah, understood. Um, but this law has been yes, it passed the first reading, and then it was sent to um, committee. Basically yeah to the, the committees and what happened there because i've heard that they got a lot of amendments and yeah in not like a couple of you know, hundreds but thousands it, of amendments it's right? uh i think uh it's near four thousand and uh two hundred amendments uh have been uh, uh it's have been more than such quantity uh and they have uh, been for two weeks because uh, this uh, draft bill were passed uh i think 7th of february and uh, according to the, our rules uh parliament uh, our deputies were given two weeks uh, 
for amendments. And for two weeks, <laughs> such big quantity were given. And does, that, does that mean that uh, someone is trying to stop the bill? Uh, what does it mean? Because for me, this seems very unrealistic to be able to actually debate and vote in the parliament. Um, I think it's a politic. It's a politic that opposition uh, in our parliament, uh, our parliamentary opposition, try to uh, receive some uh, points, political, in uh, this way they speculated uh, about this bill uh, they said some very i think not really uh, really truth narratives about it and tried to stop this bill as long as it take as long as they can but uh, i think maybe one week or maybe two weeks and this uh, draft bill will be uh, start hearings in parliament after the committee uh, according to our system uh, now our main committee of defense is hearing these uh, amendments and uh, and make a decision which amendments to uh, propose to accept to parliament or which to not to accept and after that, the parliament uh, will hear this draft bill uh, for second hearing, uh, reading. And uh, also, <laughs> it will be voting for every amendment. <laughs> so, so if those 4,200 amendments goes all the way into the parliament, uh, that seems like a filibustering method to me um erland we have uh, we have our parliament have uh, such uh, uh, <laughs> such situation had already such situation and have experience how to go through uh, because we have a, a before full scale innovation draft bill about um, uh, about uh, agricultural land and i think there were maybe 11,000 of amendments. <laughs> That's the, the, insane. Did, did they manage to pass the law anyway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The law passed. Yeah. Okay, and so there is there is a way for parliament to actually uh, go around those. Uh, yeah, those. I think I think in April it will be it will pass. Okay, that's good news. Um, how how high uh, confidence do you have that it will pass? Um, uh, I can uh, tell much, but uh, I am in a work group in a, uh, Parliament, one of uh, the work group uh, in uh, in a committee of uh, one second, please. Sorry. Yeah, so you're basically in a uh, uh, revision group for for um... yeah yeah work group in uh, uh, I think it's not very correct but uh, legal committee I I think you understand and we discussed some uh, sides of this draft bill uh, which uh, changes our procedure law uh, court uh, decision and something like that and we discussed and. Uh, uh, the chief of committee uh, says that uh, it will be passed uh, not so fast as they planned, but it will be, it will pass. Okay, that, that's uh, good to hear. I hope um, it gets through the parliament as fast as possible, um, and then I guess we can maybe do an update on how the final result uh, will be. I hope it will be a fair system. It's, I think, the main issue in yeah, this the situation. Yeah, it's very important, of course, that it's fair to the people who will be conscripted. And that also, for me, personally, it's very important that, that Ukraine conscripts the people that can contribute the most um, to the military. And I, you know, having updated information about all the soldiers, 
a fair system so you don't get really unmotivated soldiers is very very important yeah it's uh, it's quite not easy to solve this problem it's yeah. not only about uh, uh, words and rules it's 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 about more yeah I understand. And you're basically taking people out of their normal lives, uh, force them into the military. And if the system isn't working properly, you, you, you're going to have issues with uh, uh, soldiers trying to dodge the, the mobilization and in, and also unmotivated soldiers, with, which will affect all the other uh, soldiers. So I really yeah. hope that uh, it's going to work out. And Ukraine needs to train more soldiers um, and I hope that starts as soon as possible. Yeah, but uh, also uh, we start to change uh, system, not only use mobilization, but use um, uh... contract soldiers, basically, yeah, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Volunteer service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So y Ukraine tr uh, tries to offer more... Um, professional contracts uh, and in, have some incentives for people to join the military, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think uh, uh, the very uh, good brigades like uh, Azov, like uh, Sword uh, Storm Brigades, like uh, Battalion of Vovki da Vinci uh, and other units are practice in this sphere and also 47 brigade also mostly consists from uh, volunteers yeah thank you i i think um, i'm going to turn uh, back to joseph if anyone else has any questions to vasil please go ahead thank you erland and uh, vasil so um up next uh we have a uh, our update as a normal by german aid to ukraine uh however he's mentioned that it's a, a brief update this week and then uh, i wanted to ask about these uh, 800,000 shells that we've heard some news about this week uh, so over to you uh, german aid to ukraine um yeah thank you um first of all to to everyone uh thanks for tuning in um i'm feeling not so good um but sick so um yeah um, Joseph, do you want me to ask first about the sheds or do you want to make the uh, update first? I think update first, but up to you, man. Sure. Uh, we are starting with Wednesday um, in cooperation with the German association um, Heidenheim für Ukraine DEV. Um, the city of Arlen is donating a firefighting vehicle to Ukraine, which is to be brought to Zaporizhia very soon. There, it will be used with units of the State Emergency Service of Ukraine. On the same day, we got new details about the German participation in the Second Artillery Ammunition Initiative for Ukraine. The government spokesperson uh, announced that Germany will invest a three-digit million sum in the located Wi-Fi uh, 155 ammunition, um, but he did not yet want to give an exact figure. And already latest uh, last item, um, on Thursday, the German embassy uh, in Ukraine published that organic farmers in eastern and southern Ukraine has received generators financed uh, by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the German government to help them withstand power outages and maintain production. It was also announced that they will donate um, another around 160 donators, uh, generators, um, which are to be delivered by the end of this year. Yeah, and that's already the update for, for this week. Hey, man, every every bit helps, right? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask you, so I, you know, I was doing my news report like I do and uh, wor working on all the items, and I saw this 800 shells uh, news uh, coming up, and I was like, okay, I'll just, you know, I'll, I, I saw like some different, I saw headlines that didn't, match up or didn't make sense to me like reading them one after another they sort of contradicted each other i guess and i was like okay i'll just in my news report i'll read what happened and i'll in in my news report i'll, I'll clear it up but 
I was like <laughs> unable to make heads or tails of it in the time it took me to compile the news report. So I thought I would just ask you about it because you probably had a clear understanding because at least Germany's involved. So you probably know kind of the, the big picture of what's going on. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd ask you about it. So basically, I read three articles. One article said they don't have enough money for all the shells yet. One article said they have exactly the amount they need for all the shells. And one article said they have more money than they need and they want to get more shells or the plan at least is to get more shells. Uh, go ahead. Then 800,000. Go ahead. Yeah, so my understanding of the situation is that um, originally announced in February 2024 were 800,000 shells, right? 500,155 and 300,122. Um, after Norway joined the initiative, I believe it was after Norway joined um, with, Erlen, please correct me, 150 million euros. Um, they um, First, there's a 1 million shell pledge. Um, they... The Norway and Norwegians are, from my understanding, the only source which spoke of up to one million shells. Um, important to notice um, that they said and other types of artillery ammunition after 155. So it's not that they have found more ammunition of 155 or 122. Um, we are talking about another unnamed caliber, artillery, uh, artillery caliber, which could, of course, be um, a lot of different stuff. Um, but as far as I know, the Norwegian government was the only um, source talking about these what, up to 1 million sheds. So I would be cautious uh, with it, but in any way, it's great news. Um, after Norway pledged, um, the president, Pavel, uh, said they that they have now the financing for all 800,000 sheds, um, which was very very good news and just a day later i believe i believe it was a day later uh fiala the prime minister of the sec republic said um that it's not eight hundred thousand shells they have now the uh, money to buy the first batch and the first batch is three hundred thousand shells um of course it would be better to to have all the money for eight hundred thousand shells but three hundred thousand shells um most likely um 155 or a lot of the stuff 155 is very very good news taking into account that this will be delivered in the next few weeks right i mean it's very very good news regardless i hope that yeah, was a good summary or yeah i think so i think it makes yeah? sense okay. so so i would say it sounds like they are on track to have the money for all all 800,000 shells 300,000 shells is a done deal. You know, money's been promised for maybe 800,000, maybe. If not, then it seems like we're, we're reaching that goal. Um, and then maybe on the table, assuming Norway isn't hallucinating, is maybe to like look for more shells in addition to that. Is that kind of a broad summary? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, for example, with the 300,000, the first batch, right? The 300,000 shells. I really don't think that the German commitment, for example, is included in this. Although we have publicly said that we are um, contributing to the initiative, um, during the week when they already said that they have enough money now, um, the government spokesperson still said it's where we are on very, very advanced talks and we already know that we are providing a couple of hundred million euros. Um, but a contract or something else was not signed yet. So I don't think that the sex side would would say hey this is guaranteed money from the germans you know or we have now the funding for me when he says we have now the funding it's we have 100 percent secured uh money right and with the germans it it wasn't the case back then so i think the 300,000 are very very good and in the near term there will be at least 100,000 shells um from from other partners which are i mean Germany, for example, let's say they're investing 300 uh, million euros. That's about 75,000 shells or something, right? In addition to that, um, again, so I think there, there will be very, very quickly um, coming more shells up to these 300,000. Yeah, I think that's a, a fairly uh, accurate summary. 
Uh, yeah, so um, I think up next actually is going to be, I think probably the drone drone stuff next, and then, then Jonathan. Does that work for you guys? Yeah, that's good for me. Cool, cool. Uh, Daniela, uh, welcome. I know you've been hard at work in the in the in the basement with uh, with Gick and Andrew, uh, compiling data and and making graphs and infographics and such. So you've got an update for us. Uh, you do great work on on the drone stuff, uh, and so uh, definitely looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, so go ahead, over to you. I don't know if Daniela is, is awake. Maybe I fell asleep at the keyboard. It's possible, man. They're they're busy plotting plotting where drones ge geolocating drones and and all that. Ha um, ha, ha, ah. ha, ha, ha. <laughs> ha ha ha. There he is. <laughs> I'm not sleeping. I was speaking, even thanking everyone for uh, stay tuned tonight. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I I did. I just changed my my laptop to the Mac and, and I forget to check the microphone. Silly, silly thing. Uh, anyway, yeah, um, no, I, I, today, tonight, I, I would like to speak about um, two topics. One is a very brief update on uh, what's going on in terms of FPV. I just, yeah, last night I, I updated the stats and I made uh, a couple of tweets regarding that. And the results so far are quite uh, encouraging because we can see a good progression uh, um, under all the, um, the categories. In particular, infantry vehicles are both uh, with Ukraine ahead and not, not just few um, drone strike, but many hundred. And um, I, I don't know. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, yeah, the, the progression is this one. So normally what I'm trying to do is try always to, to report this data in a consistent way. So this is the progression, is what I call progression. You can see that as this growth has been quite steep, uh, now it's going quadratically, but it, it could change. Uh, unfortunately <laughs> for, uh, for Geek and, uh, and Andrew that have to do all the heavy lifting in finding all the sources in the videos and identify every target. And they also, uh, a, a, a couple of weeks ago, on a week ago, told uh, us that it, it was becoming very difficult to, to manage to do the work in one day because the amount of strike was increasing so much. I, 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 I mean, in general, but especially FPV strikes. And this is confirmed by the amount of data that then you can see. I mean, in, um, in February, we had uh, 2,560 strikes on Ukrainian side. Uh, and this is way more than, uh, than, than the, 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 the previous month. So, I mean, the increase is, is, is very, is, is, is very sub substantial and already now, which we are uh, the 10th, the 10th of March, these, these stats are one day old. We have already 721 strikes. These are inclusive of everything from infantry, vehicle, position, and they will grow fast. I mean, th this is only nine days. Uh, in the, the total number is staggering. I mean, we have uh, more than 8,273 strikes from Ukraine and 6,000 from Russia. So we start to see that there is a gap. There is definitely a gap. And of course, it's very difficult to say why there is this gap, but there are several, at least three potential uh, um, elephant in the room. So the first one is that they have less drones, which means a, a problem to the root. So they don't have enough drone to, to field. But the other can be a more uh, a problem related more to the to the drone operator, which is possible because um, uh, I'm not aware, and here Andrew could help more, uh, of more organic uh, um, drone pilot programs. Ukraine has a lot and has been going uh, very well so far on this side. So if you don't have, you, you may have a thousand and thousand of drones, but if you don't have um, essentially the pilots, you cannot fly them. So this could be another issue. Or another one, the last one that I, I was thinking is um, is the warheads, because um, we start to see 
more and more difficulties in finding uh, warheads to the point that Ukrainian forces are starting to develop um, purpose-built uh, warheads in order to have a more effective, more safe, but also a reliable logistic of this type of ammunition. And um, and in terms of Russia, I, I didn't see that. They are probably working on that as well because it's a, both ha share the same problem and have the same aims. So we don't have to be fooled by the good results of the past months because the Russia will Russians will keep improving their capabilities. But so far, uh, I, I can I can see that there is a mixture of all these problems for for the Russian. And and this is ref reflect also in the stats that you can see there. I mean, uh, in terms of uh, uh, infantry uh, per month, uh, the, the, the February has been. Uh, a, a tragedy because the i mean a tragedy for uh, for the russian uh, uh, we had more than 1445 strikes which is uh, enormous and and this reflects also what's happening on the ground the russians are trying to um, lay the ground for their offensive so they need to push as much as possible and so they expose themselves and even these months you can see um a, a quite substantial advantage it could change it could change, uh, but but the, the 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 rate at which they are in, increasing it, it is very much um, big. I mean, is a is a is incredible. I, I'm always uh, aware of what's happening on the ground because I review mon many many videos, and it's very these are numbers, but essentially these are strikes on people. And if you go on. Um, on the next one is uh, is in terms of vehicles and vehicles is is the usual as many have started to to look at my stats and but now i have a debate on this with many many other um, contributors on the field because many say oh well uh, the strikes on vehicles are higher because uh, russians are using more vehicles Yes, and then this is my critique to them, because uh, this is a war. This is not like a war game. And if you are not able to understand that there is a threat and take an action against that, you, and you are losing so many vehicles, it's your fault, and you are doing bad your 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 own work. So I, I see this as an advantage because the Russian, in order to operate, in order to do what they have to do, they have to expose more vehicles, and many of these are also logistical vehicles. Uh, and if you follow Andrew, you will see that uh, sometime you have 10 uh, trucks uh, loaf uh, destroyed. So this means that there is also a selection of the target. Yeah, and, I, I uh, want to say that, no, I yeah, add that they don't just strike, uh, you know, tanks. They strike all kind of vehicles. Um, and recently, a lot of, you know, these buggy golf cars and vans, uh, consistently been striking vans for a long time and Russia could do this as well but they're not doing it at the same rate it seems like they've hit so many vans bukhankas i think they're called or loaves that uh they're now using the golf carts more <laughs> because they've actually actually the golf the, the golf carts has has been uh, you know operating in the rear until now but what they use the golf carts for now is actually what a bmp should be used for so you know they're using them as armored uh, in, in, to replace armored vehicles to storm positions, uh, which is crazy. But they're doing it, so they're going to lose them. That's yeah, I just I, I know Andrews noted a loaf shortage on the front line, and I know that in his little uh, or I should say little in his like updates, a lot of times it'll say like I don't know like like ten loafs destroyed it by drones, right? So very common to have those little logistics vehicles hit. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I don't think the the reason why the golf carts are being hit more is necessarily only because they don't have more loaves. Um, I think it's also because they they lack uh, certain armored vehicles and are just sending mm -hmm. people. Uh, and you know we've seen more and more examples of them storming positions with uh, with these golf carts. An arbonite car, yeah. Th that's true. That that that's completely true. And um, and also. This is a, a symptom of necessity. You use whatever you have at your disposal to accomplish your mission. And um, and this is why also I'm very skeptical with the theory, oh, well, the Russian have more and are using, they are not using all of them. This is simply uh, utterly false because whatever weapon they have been given 
as the Ukrainians, as anyone, they are using. They are using because they needed to accomplish their objectives. And um, because in the end, as crap they are, they steal an army and they have objective and they have to use their resources at the best of their capability to do what they have to do. And if they have more drones, they, sh they would have used I don't know, even throwing them with a catapult on the uh, on the enemy, but but they would have them used, and if they don't, uh, there are reason. And um, this is my my strong point uh, against so, uh, sometimes. Yeah, go on. Essentially, Sorry. what you're saying is that it is possible that uh, Russia is producing a lot of. Um, drones but they might not be using them for various reasons like they don't manage to arm them because they don't have munitions or maybe they have the munitions but they don't have the people uh available that are skilled enough to to either you know repurpose those rpg rounds and convert them for a fpv usage etc so you essentially you can say that you produce three hundred thousand drones but if you don't manage to actually complete the process of making it into a weapon then you don't have the drone um so if they had those they would have used them and yes, we don't absolutely. see it yeah and uh, the other point is that you may say oh they don't have enough resources to um produce the video that's false they have much more uh, capabilities in in, uh, in propaganda than than ukrainians this is this is uh, always has been like that they have a very uh, well established system that do this so uh, my my, my beliefs is that they have probably a bit less because you don't procure on a, on to china or other companies uh, in other foreign countries drones of this type we are not talking about the shahed which steal a, a much more sophisticated weapon but you are committing to to buy these drones from foreign producer but you are producing out producing your enemy you you don't do this you simply you don't so for sure they have difficulties on that Maybe it's not uh, dramatic, but there's still a gap. And this is, of, of course, ag aggravated by other factors because there is never one single problem affecting you when you have these uh, complex issues. And, um, and to going forward, there is, of course, uh, another, uh, another uh, area which uh, was driving my attention, which was the, the strike composition, which honestly, Honestly, I have to thank Andrew as much as I can because he was the first by bold eye looking at thousands of videos telling me, look, you have to look at position because position is where something important is happening. And, and then I just took his data, analyzed the data, analyzed a lot of video, unfortunately, and start to understand what's going on. And um, if you go, yeah, the, in this pie chart, essentially, I regroup um the, the the strike composition for type of target hit and the uh, trenches are the most hit and um and the reason is because trenches are massively used and they are um a sitting duck for whoever is inside now uh, as you know i also uh, wrote with your help and also um cj help uh, an article on these which has been published and um and in this article, and this brings me to, to the second part, um, I tried to, to discuss uh, the trench, war trench warfare in general, but also how this has been changed by the advent of FPV drones. So in, in the article, I tried to introduce the topic. I tried to make some un minimum an understanding of what a trench is and why a trench is used and so on. And then... Uh, with the, some knowledge about uh, area defense, which is, of course, used. I tried to analyze a few scenarios, a few maps, as this one is one of those that I was analyzing, try to uh, mix the data uh, in terms of heat map from FPV strikes and um, data from um, controlled areas, but also uh, satellite uh, imagery, which show us uh, um, an important truth. Uh, Russians, at, uh, until now had a, uh, um, a superiority in terms of number of shells. So they have way more shell than the Ukrainian and can fire more. But they use the 
shell in combination with the FPV drones. There is one uh, one uh, one uh, picture that I I posted here was um, I think in um, Marinka. I think you should go up if you want to show that. It's probably the, the very first one, which show you how um, some tree line where we know that there are trenches inside and defensive position. The Russians have uh, been bombarding with artillery you can see the crater from uh, from the, the satellite and then they strike with fpv drone now we don't have exactly the timing of everything but every time you see the you, you see this pattern this one this one you can see the 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 crater especially uh, now you can zoom but the the one on the top each of them has a lot of crater um around and these were these walls are fortunately a, a, a Ukrainian control area. You see these, uh, you see the building going down. You see the artillery um, destroying whatever is around uh, the tree lines. The tree lines probably the, there are no more tree lines there. And then you you storm them with FPV drone. Infantry has a little protection because some of these uh, trenches are not exactly built. To the to the to the scope of protecting you from FPV drones. Some are just uh, very deep, but completely unprotected and uncovered uh, uh, trench. So uh, the combination of um, of FPV drone with uh, um, observation drone is 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 really fatal. I saw so many life losses in South Robotine. Really, really, really a lot. Because uh, of course they have Ukrainians try to take back the trenches. They take back the trenches. They are they are bombarded by mortars. They have to dig in. They cannot go out. And then the FPV arrived and kill one by one. And, and this is this is what happened on a regular basis. And this is why I decided to do this article in order to try to um, make people understanding how trenches probably are not obsolete because you need you need a line of defense somehow but need to change also in their use and i think and what we are also looking from the, the the most recent data of the last last nine days is that the ukraine is slightly moving on a more mobile defense and uh, this is a complete speculation on myself so i take responsibility for what i say but i think also the fact that we had a change in the in the command may have introduced a difference because we see also more vehicle loss. Also, we see Abrams, we see some other uh, other vehicle loss, but we see also more engaging, a more uh, a more mobile uh, defense, which try to move and uh, attack the enemy when he's on its move instead of waiting for it. So is the 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 entire scenario that we imagine that okay, you you have a trench, the trench is safe. It is not, it never been, but now is even less, especially because you cannot feel the electric warfare every, everywhere. So um, some some aspects need to change. For example, trenches like this one are, are, um, are li literally very bad for the infantry because they are completely without any protection from even the visible light. You don't need the thermal to hunt down infantry in this type of trench. You just need a good drone with a 4K camera and you are good to go. So a lot of have to be done in order to start to cover up and uh, at least conceal the content of the trenches. Um, in the article, I also start to think about why don't introduce decoy position. So position that are made and built to attract and distract FPV the operator to attack potential target, which are essentially decoy, and try to um, save as much life as possible, especially when trenches are manned. Uh, another thing that I discussed here, of course, is the possibility, and I know that Ukraine is actively working on that, um, start to field the uh, um, unmanned the machine gun and grenade launcher position. So uh, these can be operated from back position and in, in order to try to uh, react quickly to any any type of threat and in case send a, a quick reaction force rather than have the entire trench line manned and exposed to FPV threat, especially when you don't have anything to counter it. Sorry for my monologue. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Daniela. Well, I, I recommend if you're interested to visit touchni.info. Uh, this article is long, but it's uh, it's very interesting if you if you care about this subject. And uh, uh, please also contact us if you have any you know uh, insights or point of views, things we you think that we we didn't uh, that Daniela didn't discuss here, um, because I think this is you know. A very important topic that needs to be discussed. So touchni.info. You can see the address here. And I guess I'll turn it back to Joseph if there is no other questions to Daniela from anyone. Thank you, Erland. Uh, yeah, and also shout out to Germany to Ukraine for improving the website for us a bit. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, up next, I think we just have a Q and A, and then uh, we'll we'll close out. So um, I will go ahead and start looking. You, you forgot uh, Jonathan, man. No, no, no. Jonathan's segment's going to be at the end. Okay, after questions. Yes. Understood. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, does, does anyone think that, uh, let's see, ba, ba, ba. do you have a good question, Alan, to start with? I wasn't focusing on that right, right now, but, uh, <laughs> sorry, let me look. I saw a question in the, in the chat and, um, just to break the ice and, um, do you want me to read it? Yeah, sure. of course. Go ahead. Yeah, so from Katie's guest, and will someone be counting the number of those gigantic 2,000 lib bombs? We we could, <laughs> we definitely can, because the data is there. We need to find a volunteer to do that. Erland, you want to do that? <laughs> yeah, it, oh it, it's an important topic, but yes, yeah, Erland, you can go on. Oh my god, yeah. Well. Oh. Andrew is putting uh, these strikes in his database, so I don't know if we can if it does differentiation between all the different airstrikes. But okay, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, yeah, sorry. Oh no, no, no. Go ahead. no. My my only point is that yeah, uh, it's probably the um, the only issue is that we um, he do not always differentiate between different fab model. So only a strike, but because he put all the evidence, if we really want to explore that, uh, it could be it, it could be done. But it requires a lot of work, of course. But it can be done. Yeah. If, if anyone wants to sit in Andrew's basement, I think there is space. Okay, I think I found a question. I uh, I got a little uh, overexcited there. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, because uh, I remember we talked about this. Uh, Kellen Dunn asks, uh, there were rumors that uh, Russia is using fiber optic lines on their drones to spoof electronic warfare. And is this true and effective? Uh, so, Erland, uh, do you remember that uh, that drone we saw? Yeah, I, I saw it. Uh, it's interesting. Um, I don't. I didn't see any proof. Uh, that this has been fielded successfully. Uh, just some images about uh, or of a drone that is basically releasing a fiber optic uh, thread for for. You know, Imagine like a kite, but a but a drone, right? Well, it's basically dispersing this this thread um, instead of using radio com communication, and that's uh, not a new thing. I mean, uh, a lot of anti tank guided missiles, like the TOW, uh, uses a small copper wire uh, that it disperses uh, for, uh, you know, uh, controlling the, the the missile. So this is basically following that principle. The difference here is that FPV drones often go 10, 15 kilometers, um, mainly around 10 kilometers. And that's a long way to, to disperse such a thin thread. And, and I, I have some suspicion that it might get a little bit problematic um, with wind and uh, foliage and all that stuff could tangle up the thread and uh, but if if the system works then that's a big problem because then you you won't be able to jam it uh, traditionally you would only be able to jam or not jam it you would be 
it po it's possible to destroy electronics with microwaves and this drone wouldn't be uh, uh, defeating that sort of uh, electronic warfare but um, it would defeat all other jamming efforts so that's uh, a little bit worrying but I still don't see any proof that it's being fielded successfully so I think there's a lot of complications uh, you know doing that that they need to to manage to yeah uh, but yeah it's interesting yeah it's definitely an interesting development oh go ahead Daniel oh sorry no I, I I want to 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 back down on that on that last point because uh, uh, one of the most important things that you have to understand, FPV drones are very fast and are characterized by agility and capability of changing direction literally in a blink of an eye. So, they, they, so this is not very ideal with a thread attached on your, on your back. So you will lose for sure agility and capability of operating in the same way. Plus the range would be downsized quite a lot. Uh, so I honestly don't don't see these as, I mean, a toe is much more lethal and uh, is much more, uh, can have much more payload. So I, I don't think these uh, will be a significant change in the battlefield. Yeah, so the thing that makes me skeptical is that the weight of the overall drone is very... It's a lot less than a big missile, right? And uh, that means that any sort of like pull on 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 this thread uh, would would affect the drone a lot more. So it seems, you know, a little bit implausible that the, this would be working. And also, if you look at this big spool of of a fiber optic thread, even if the thread is light, maybe per meter, you're still adding significant amount of weight to the drone which is going to be very problematic yeah so i think it's definitely an interesting development i think it does have an application for defeating electronic warfare systems like would you agree with that erlen yes that's that what it that's what it does i just don't know if it's practically possible to fly this, right. exactly. this thing yeah yeah, exactly. So I think like on paper, it sort of makes sense. But like in practice, it seems like it's going to get tangled up in a tree or something. You know, it just seems like the practicality of it um, in outside of certain specific circumstances seems a bit limited. And it's not going to like revolutionize drone warfare tomorrow. But we'll definitely keep an eye out for use cases of it. And uh, maybe Ukraine deploys something similar or something like that. Uh, and we'll, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, imagine this thread is super light, right? And you have this this drone that the specific you know, advantage in the capability, like Daniela mentioned, is that it's agility, that it can very, very rapidly dive and swirl around 360 degrees. Uh, what's going to happen? It's going to, you know, chop the cable immediately. And then it just falls down, down to the ground. So it seems very impossible, tech like practically. Technically, it does defeat uh, jamming. So... Yeah, I think that's a, a good summary. So um, this is like sort of a comment, but I can sort of turn it into something. Um, so uh, Wee Bit Furry says, uh, as far as I know, deliveries are coming uh, or or at least guaranteed. Um, I, I would just mention like sort of off of that, um, we did hear some reports from some Ukrainian guys on the front lines, like we finally have shells. Like it's all completely anecdotal. We don't have any like real confirmations or photographic evidence or anything like that. but. Um, I don't know. Do, we, we've heard some noise, uh, Erlen. Would you say that's a, a fair statement? Oh, I would say that that's a fair statement. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think uh, you know we've heard some noise about it. Um, hopefully, it'll be um, you know we'll we'll hear that Ukrainians have tons of shells and things are going great in the future, um, or we'll get more like official uh, recognition or demonstration that uh, Ukraine has uh, the ammo that it needs. Um, let's see. Oh, um, Daniela had to step away for a second. We had a question for uh, Daniela next. Uh, bu -bu -bu. Yeah, I just wanted to add that the you know even if the, the um, promised eight hundred thousand shells are not in Ukraine yet, maybe um, they have got guarantees that 
they are arriving, so uh, they might be a little bit more uh, prone to release some of their um, the ammunition they have in storage. So there have been some messages from certain groups on the front line saying, yeah, that we sh- sh- suddenly got shells now and we're shooting more and the, there's been an uptick in the numbers. And I, I I just speculate that it could be the fact that they're releasing more willingly from the storages because they know more ammunition is coming in. So that's my speculation. Yeah, thanks, Erlen. Okay, so I have another question from Kellen Dunn, uh, which a, a great question, Kellen. Now, these are all like stuff, this is like literally the stuff we talk about <laughs> on our server, like uh, when we're trying to, trying to figure things out ourselves. Um, So do you guys believe that the two Patriot launchers were hit recently? Um, German AT Crane, would you please give us your presentation on how you're definitely sure that they were Patriot batteries for sure, 100% confirmation. Go ahead. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. I'm (laughs) strong. I'm strongly against. I'm just kidding. He's Uh, very against this idea that we have any confirmation. Um, I just want to point out, I'm not saying that these were not Patriot uh, launchers or Patriot equipment in general. I just haven't seen any um, any proof of, of these vehicles actually being uh, vehicles of an air defense system. I mean, Germany, for example, alone, alone Germany delivered dozens of these trucks, exactly these trucks, which are used to, for example, um, deliver ammunition to the front line and stuff like this, right? The the vehicle column was way too small in in my opinion. And yes, we saw some uh, some some proof that this might be some something related to Patriot and this blah blah blah. And we saw images, but as far as I see it, like no proof we have seen has 100% confirmed indicated that this is a Patriot starter launcher or or some other Patriot equipment. All we have saw was that a column of vehicles, which are most likely MIN trucks, um, were hit by, by um, what was it, in Iskander? Uh, yeah, so in in my opinion, nobody from the from the footage we have right now, nobody can tell with one hundred percent confirmation that these are Patriot um, equipment. Um, yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, the footage is very much like people pointing at like a like collection, a pile of like 10 pixels and going, see, that's a Patriot battery. I mean, it's like really hard to tell. And then the final result of the object, when you finally sort of get a more clear view of it, it has been reduced to what amounts to scrap metal. So you can tell it was like some kind of truck, but like it's, it'd be really difficult to tell exactly what that thing was based on the stuff we have. Um, I know John mentioned like the cook-off kind of looks like a SAM, uh, like a service air missile, um, which, you know, that narrows it down maybe a bit again not not confirmed but that's just like john's like i've seen a lot of sams blow up kind of looks like that um that could be a ton of other things you know i'd say andrew and gick like do this the most right of anyone i know and i think probably anyone who's done it actually for ukraine specifically um like i would i would challenge anyone to show me who's who's done visual identification of destroyed stuff more and both of them are like we don't know what that is and so to me that's like those guys can identify stuff like pretty well. And if they're saying we don't know for sure, could be vampire, could be Patriot, could be whatever, definitely not confirmed, but possibly Patriot. Certainly we're not ruling it out. Um, that to me is like pretty solid evidence that it's, it, there probably isn't a good expert on the internet. that can tell you that that was definitely Patriot or not. There's probably intelligence services that know and stuff, but we're not going to know. Um, I don't know. What do you think Maurice? Yeah, I mean, the the intelligence services, especially, uh, especially Ukraine's um, closest allies, will surely know if this was a Patriot um, or this was Patriot equipment or not. I mean, we all have to understand, even if this was a, um, some kind of Patriot equipment, like two launchers and maybe a logistical vehicle and stuff like this, um, until they they don't have destroyed um, unless sorry unless they have uh, they don't have destroyed um, the the command post or um, the radar right I mean the the whole battery still functions they have just less launchers right it's it's not like the whole air defense system is destroyed um, 
And uh, yeah, so and and the closest allies like uh, the US, Germany, and the Netherlands, in case this actually was something related to Patriot, these three nations should be know uh, should know this, because um, although um, when when I saw that right, um, this was most likely uh, or these trucks looked like MAN trucks, so not the US vehicles, so. Um, when I were in charge in Ukraine, right, and some some launchers were were hit, uh, I would go to to Germany and to uh, the Netherlands and say, "Hey, can you replenish this? Right? Can you send us another two or three launchers?" I mean, the um, the Dutch have sent Patriot launchers to to, um, and the Germans also have sent two additional ones. So. I mean, it doesn't it make sense to to just ask them, "Hey, can you replenish this?" And then everything is working. Um, for for me, it makes sense. Yeah, so they so. would know. Yeah, yeah. So definitely a good question. Like, I think that's kind of one of the reasons we uh, started Tochni or like work on Tochni is like we see noise in the in the news or on Twitter or on other social media about like, oh, two Patriot batteries destroyed. And then, you know, people like uh, Germanade or Andrew or, you know, uh, Gick or Daniela, like actually go look into it and go like, do we actually know what this thing was? Like, can we prove that? Or can we demonstrate that with the information we have? Um, so yeah, I think it's a good example of like uh, stuff, stuff we like to clear up uh, at Tochni. Um, Daniela is back. Uh, he's dealing with a, a kid uh daniela okay, sorry I, oh, can i, I yeah, yeah. Course, just one very second uh very fast because it's it's still related to the same topic um skr has there um been a denial concerning patriot launchers from the ua side um not that i have seen um not to be honest but n neither have i seen proof or an anybody else like Ukrainian media saying 100% according to government so, uh, sources or someone else. I haven't seen this. Yeah. Such so, news. Yeah, Officially, so, absolutely. Yeah. So neither denied nor um, nor nor um, confirmed. Yeah. So sorry, Joseph. Oh yeah, no worries. Thanks, thanks, Maurice. Uh, so Daniela, um, I had a uh, we had a question from uh, Mitch Ashdown. I think it's a like an important question. It's totally totally valid question for any type of uh, statistical research. Are there any inbuilt biases in examining the videos uh, from the available data? Like, do you feel like there's some kind of a sample bias from like what stuff gets filmed or, or things like that? And like, how do you uh, interpret uh, the data itself? Like, uh, in terms of, do you feel that there's any kind of bias in that data? Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I th thank you for the question. I'm, I'm totally aware about that. So, uh, first of all, the the reason why I'm quite, uh, I think the data are quite robust is because uh, it's not done by one single person. Now there are nearly four people working on that, but mainly Andrew Geek and little, very little that I do, is done independently. We cross check and often we correct each other. And uh, mainly Andrew and Geek, I do very little. I do more the analysis. And um, and essentially more than, I think, uh, 2,000 sources, uh, even more, are daily uh, scrapped by um, Andrew and Geek. And now they have another, another help, uh, another um, collaborator. And so they take all these videos, all these informations, and they start to look at them, categorize first. So they create a, a very first iteration of the database daily, and then they start to analyze the data. In 24 hours, most of the time, they nearly do everything, which means they geolocate and verify uh, the, geo the location of the target, the type of attack, who has been attacked, by what, and, and of course, the database in, in improved because also I was asking questions. And so um, the, 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 the way on how data has been collected and also categorized has been changed a little bit in, in order to improve the, the reliability of the data. But in terms of sources, the sources are essentially Russian and Ukrainians on both sides. And there was no 
um, built-in uh, bias. When uh, you see bad things happening to Ukrainians, of course, you you are sad, maybe angry, because sometimes, as I saw people sent uh, in those trenches, I, I felt really bad for that. But I have to write about that, because uh, I think it's, it's important. Because our society is, um, flourish when there is accountability and when trustworthy information is delivered. If I hide the data because I don't like it, I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't do a good service to, to anyone interested in this and, and neither to the friends, actual friends that I have there. So it's um for us is is a and, and and it's a touching mission is to be reliable when, when we deal with information. And if anyone say, Oh Daniele, you have an error here. I'm always very happy because this means someone read <laughs> and tried to improve the data rather than I don't take oh, a, like a blame. But yes, we try always to double check everything and also use satellite information, but also uh, news about attacks. For example, when we see a peak of a certain type of uh, strikes, we know that something is happening and, and Andrew do this uh, for his maps. And so he, we don't use just videos, essentially. We also use the satellite information when, when available and when possible and when needed. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela. So I think I'm at basically the end of my questions. I have like one more uh, thing I'll add, but does anyone have any questions they saw from the chat uh, anywhere that they want to get, get through? Um, just the, the latest question um, regarding the Greek weapon deliveries. Um, I don't know if, if someone saw anything like any update on, on the announcements or reports yeah to my knowledge it hasn't been disclosed but that might have changed this week but i know i asked colby like last week and he said that it, nothing no specifics have been discussed at all and i think at one point they took something off the table specifically i don't remember what yeah and and i don't talk about grace and nobody else seems to know something so yeah yeah, but I think overall we've seen a slight like tone shift from the Greek uh, messaging. Like, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of debate over whether or not uh, the missiles were near the prime minister of Greece in Odessa or whatever. But the point is, he was in Odessa, he was talking to Zelensky, and a big Russian missile attack happened. And they probably could, at the very least, they definitely could hear it. They probably, at the very least, could see it. That's the point. Um, and, uh, I think that that has resulted in kind of some messaging from the Greek government that seems a bit more, um, uh, I don't know, like strong than usual. And then also that meeting itself kind of signaled a broader diplomatic initiative that Greece seems to be taking to, I don't know exactly why they've done this, but they seem to be trying to increase their diplomatic ties with Ukraine a bit. So, um, I think we're seeing like positive shifts from Greece. Um, Greece does have a lot of very valuable stuff that Ukraine can use, like a lot of old Soviet stuff that Ukraine's very familiar with and can sort of just plug into their existing uh, military. Um, so I think we, we definitely want to see uh, like more stuff from Greece and we want to know exactly, we want to know how many, you know, S-300 missiles and stuff they're sending, but uh, so far we haven't heard anything yet. Yeah, and actions speak louder than words, right? Isn't this how you say it? It's, um, let's see. It's definitely how the French think about Ukraine. Sorry? So that's definitely how the French feel about their aid to Ukraine. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, no, I actually think that the, the French itself think they are doing very, very much. And yeah, just, I mean, they're just kind of like frustratingly quiet about what, like, a lot of stuff the French send. We don't hear that the French don't announce it. We see video of it in Ukraine or fake pictures before we know about it, right? Yeah, and I mean the the contributions of France were much more than publicly known. That's true, and I think that everyone should acknowledge this. Um, still, it's it's way too less. Like I I would I would say that France, with with its military and um, industrial power, um, should at least give the same amount of military equipment to Ukraine as Germany does. And when, when you're just taking account, into account the, the 155 millimeter ammunition, right? Like, what, what have they said they're providing now to Ukraine? Like 3,000 shells per month. 
This is I I I mean I'm not following France as closely as Germany, of course, but it feels like that the shift in Germany is way too is still way too less or is too too small. Um, but we are doing a lot of stuff, and even compared to to the French, is the French are doing. It feels like nothing, at least in my eyes. It's, yeah. Every, yeah, everything the French have publicly disclosed has been kind of disappointing. But uh, we have seen some stuff privately that is impressive. I'll put it that way. But yeah, mixed bag with France. We definitely want to see more uh, coming from the French. We think they're much more capable to help. And uh, we've definitely seen a, a Germany kind of step up and more meaningfully. Um, you know, uh, anything else you want to add on that, uh, Germinator? No, no, no. And just okay. to to make clear, it's it's not about like pricing Germany too much or so. Like I said, we we are missing out on opportunities, and we could do much more. Um, it's I mean Germany is doing more than everybody else, but I as a German say it's it's not enough. I mean, yeah, don't don't want to get into too much detail. It's hey, it's just hey, look, frustrating. Man, I'm I'm from the U.S. and I'm just gonna try to keep my head down right now. Um, anyways, uh, I, I wanted to add like this is, isn't quite a, a direct question from the audience, but I'm just sort of I'm, I'm sort of channeling a sort of question from the ether of the internet. Okay, so last uh, stream we had our best, our most popular stream ever, and we were like very excited. We were like, oh, like the YouTube promotion, uh, or like YouTube has recognized us for the partner program or whatever. Um, which I thought we were like, oh, this must it must be a recognition of that or something. But we looked it up and like. 25% of our traffic came from a Finnish military forum. Uh, I don't, I could not pronounce the name for the life of me, but uh, we definitely, we, I want to say shout out to uh, those guys. We really appreciate uh, you guys stopping by. Um, what happened is Ben's uh, graph really made the rounds on the internet last week. Um, it got picked up by a lot of big accounts. Uh, thank goodness, Erland mentioned, Ben was like, ah, my, my graph's done, guys. I'm going to put it out, okay? And Erland was like, watermark that. Um, and he did. And then a lot of big accounts picked it up. So as a result, um, the graph itself appeared on a Finnish military forum uh, where they uh, sort of examined it. And they were like, not sure where it comes from. Looks like these Toshni guys found the stream. Here they are. And we were very kind of interested in what they had to say about us. But the point is, they raised two good points that I know Ben wanted to clear up about his number. So if you saw last week, Ben made a graph. Um, so I guess first off, real quick, shout out. If any of the Finns have stuck around with us as a result of their contact with our program, uh, you know, uh, we definitely appreciate it. We love Finland. Uh, it's a beautiful country I hope to visit someday. And uh, we hope to get uh, Finnish contributors to Tochni at some point. That would be amazing. Um, but yeah, moving on from that, uh, their actual questions I thought were worth uh, mentioning. Uh, so the first is they pointed out that like Ben doesn't mention where the numbers come from. Um, so Finns, Ben, want your question that they come from the Russian Ministry of Finance. All of them are official figure, figures released from the Russian Ministry of Finance. Um, ben should have put that on the graph. He's very sorry. He was a, a very sick man, as you heard from the recording. Uh, number two, they mentioned there's something weird going on with the gold reserves. I didn't understand it. Ben actually created like code for it. Ben made an actual like software program that does that tracks the reserves. You just plug in the numbers, I think. Um, and Ben released that code. So Tochi now has a GitHub. Um, ben released the code on the GitHub. Uh, I'll try to put a link in there if I have time, like when I'm not doing Tochi stuff, um, or maybe in the comments of the video or something. So you guys are more than welcome to go look at the code. Ben is like inviting people to look at and improve the code. And I know that they pointed out some like problem or something that didn't make sense with the gold reserves. It was something I didn't fully understand, but the guy was like, the numbers for the gold reserves don't quite add up. They're like a little bit off, like a billion off or something. And Ben mentioned like, there's something wrong with the program that he's trying to fix. Um, it involves converting the gold to certain values. I think Chinese values versus Western values or something like that. So the point is, um, hopefully I, I address those two points. Number one, the data itself comes directly from the Russian Ministry of Finance. Um, so, you know, shouldn't be a question where the data came from. Number two, uh, the gold thing, if you notice, like there's a slight discrepancy in the math there, it has to do with converting the gold to the currencies of different countries. Um, so, yeah, I think that pretty much 
wraps up. Uh, and I think it's a problem. Like Ben's trying to fix that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that wraps up our Q&A unless anyone has any final uh, questions. Well, to the point that we got a lot more viewers, uh, for some reason we have uh, an insane amount of viewers on, on Twitter. And I just wanted to say to the people of good uh, X slash Twitter uh, that uh, it is a lot more, uh, how do you say, it? you get a lot more out of the YouTube stream because there is a comment field where people actually debate and, and ask questions. And yeah, it's a vivid comment field. So if you're on Twitter uh, and you, you're kind of lonely, then jump over to YouTube because I think that's uh, giving a lot better experience for the viewer. Couldn't agree more, Mr. Erland. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and uh, that with that, I think we're going to turn it over to Jonathan to uh, wrap things up. Jonathan has another uh, installment of his uh, series, uh, Ukraine's Greatest Generation. So Jonathan, over to you. Thank you, Joseph, and to all our terrific panel today. Our woman for Ukraine's Greatest Generation this week is Yana Rahishka. Yana Rahishka was born on the 2nd of April, 1993, in Vinitsia. Jana graduated in economics and law in 2015. During her student years, she was actively involved in sports and was a candidate for Master of Sports in Sambo and Judo. Jana was highly accomplished, actually, in this field, uh, particularly in Brazilian martial arts, such as capoeira, which blends elements of dance and fighting to overcome opponents who have both a physical or a technological advantage, or even opponents in greater numbers than the practitioner of this martial art, which you can see Yana in full flight uh, doing so here. I wouldn't want to be that guy. Yana Rahishka worked at an IT company before 2022. Uh, she was... Bring up the slide. Mute the chat. Right. Yeah, there we go. So she was, uh, uh, she she worked at, uh, she was a senior technical recruiter at the Kharkiv office for a, a company called Akvelon. Uh, that's in Kharkiv, pictured here in 2021 before the full-scale invasion. In the wake of the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine, Yana immediately began volunteering in Kharkiv, joining tens of thousands and millions across her country who gave up their time, their pursuits, their passions to defend their nation at great risk to themselves, as cities such as hers in Kharkiv became the focus of the concerted, concerted efforts by the Russians to destroy and occupy Ukrainian homes and lives. From August 2022, Yana became a paramedic and joined the AFU at the rank of junior lieutenant. She served as a combat medic in the 93rd Mechanized Brigade, the legendary Khorondiyar, and saved many lives in many, many places. Here are some photos of Yana during her service. Uh, you may recognize that flag. That was one from one of the rallies. Uh, so the following photo This one here uh, was taken by uh, a Radio Free Europe photographer um, in Bakhmut, in the field hospital where Yana worked, where she had been helping a constant stream of injured Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, here is the medical centre in Bakhmut, where Yana was photographed by the Associated Press just 10 days before her death, which shows the, the working environment Yana as a combat medic courageously operated in amidst the war around her, providing, as she did, urgent care to injured Ukrainian soldiers amid ever-encroaching Russian assaults. Yana became known as by the epithet of Angel of the Fighters during her time in the ZSU. On March the 3rd, Yana lost her life when a mortar strike hit the vehicle she was travelling in near Bakhmut as she helped transport Ukrainian wounded from the battlefield around that city.
It is through the words of those who knew her which perhaps describe Jana best. Jana's colleague Oksana Navajeska posted the following on Facebook on the day after Jana's death. She said, Jana was the leader of my team and she was always about people. When I first arrived in Kharkiv, Jana told me with great love about the city which had become her home and about the people in the company she worked for. Jana could have chosen an easier path. She could have left the country. She could have continued to work quietly in the IT company she was at, but she chose a much braver path. She joined the armed forces of Ukraine completely independently and as a paramedic, she saved many lives. Jana's husband said the following about his wife. Not everyone gets the chance to say goodbye to those we love or has the opportunity to honour a person in life so indomitable. Across the many tributes to Yana on a variety of social media platforms, one friend recalled, Yana once said, while we sleep, someone dies for us. Yesterday, it was her. Yana's parents refused to take any financial support for themselves upon hearing of their daughter's death. Instead, calling upon all those able to donate, to donate directly to the armed forces of Ukraine in memory of their daughter. Jana was posthumously awarded the Order of Hermanitsky on the 7th of April 2023, this award being the only Ukrainian knightly order and eponym of one of the most famous hetman of the Ukrainian Cossacks. This picture of Jana you see before you will be Tochny's picture of this week. And that's it for this week's Tochny. This group is working on and towards some interesting projects at the moment, which you may have seen recently on a variety of social media channels. So please subscribe if you haven't already to see our latest work and research. Thank you for joining us. Look forward to hearing from you all soon. Slava Ukraini. Heroim Slava. Heroim Slava. Thank you, Jonathan, for this topic.